This Future Cities Africa episode is presented by West Grove, the official tourism, trade and investment promotion agency for Cape Town and the Western Cape. Sebekedi Motlobani Kuloi, Greenfield Investment Portfolio Manager for Technology at West Grove, is my guest today. We discuss building a globally competitive tech hub. Mo, welcome. You manage the tech portfolio at West Grove. Can you give us a brief breakdown of what this involves? I'm a portfolio manager at Westgro. I look after the technology desk, um, and that predominantly involves working with uh, multinational tech companies uh, that have an interest in uh, setting up operations in the Western Cape and the city of Cape Town. Uh, and this all in realization of the ambition that not just Westgro, but a few sector bodies and stakeholders sat to get in the room and decided that we you know we're going to put a global ambition uh, for Cape Town, where we uh, position Cape Town as a leading tech hub, not just for Africa, but for the world. And ultimately, within that ambition is really seeing not just multinationals coming into the region, but as well as local tech companies receiving the full support uh, that government can offer and various other stakeholders within the ecosystem. So let's delve a bit deeper into tech ecosystems. How does the Cape Town and Western Cape tech ecosystem stand up to the rest of the world? When we look at the tech ecosystems, we look at various components uh, because any ecosystem is driven by the components that drive growth, that support the infrastructure, and they make sure that you know there is a thriving environment for the members and the constituents of that ecosystem. So when we're looking at the tech ecosystem in general broadly, we want to look at key identifiers or structures that I would let's say the fertile soil that allow for new seeds to be planted and grow. So when we look at that fertile soil, we're looking at things like large institutions, uh, robust private sector, as well as government support. And this fertile soil is the one that allows companies to firstly ideate, secondly, to work together in terms of innovation development, and then ultimately to scale and commercialize intellectual property. So when we look at these institutions, a lot of people will probably be wondering, what am I talking about? We're looking firstly, for example, at universities. Uh, Universities in any large uh, tech ecosystem are the drivers of entrepreneurship. We're seeing university-linked incubators and accelerators, technology transfer offices. This is where, you know, the grassroots IP, IP intellectual property is developed. But then again, within this setting, this intellectual property is sandboxed and allows for innovators and entrepreneurs to trial, experiment until they can create a scalable solution that can work not just uh, within a university context, but then ultimately in a societal context. Secondly, I mentioned governments. You know, uh, when it comes to institutions, we need governments that are willing to support entrepreneurship, looking to deregulate spaces and willing to partner with entrepreneurs, but more so willing to understand what it takes to grow an ecosystem that is innovative as well as that is thriving. And so when we look at the Western Cape, uh, in particular the city of Cape Town as well, uh, we've seen that there is a response from that from provincial government and local government to support entrepreneurship and innovation. And we've seen how this has been translated uh, through various initiatives such as that of the global positioning, which undertook the effort to position Cape Town as a leading tech hub. Partnerships by the city of Cape Town with the likes of Silicon Cape uh, to ensure that there's a funnel of early stage entrepreneurs and early stage companies that can scale and that can be absorbed into into industry, but more so also looking at the capacity development uh, opportunities that the Western Cape and the City of Cape Town has put in. This is looking at, for example, the Cape IT initiative that works across four or actually three sectors, which is uh, business incubation, skills incubation for, for young and unemployed youths, and more so as well as business incubation. So these verticals uh, support a, a thriving ecosystem, but make sure that government is aware of what the life cycles and journeys that any entrepreneur goes through from either skills development or ultimately the necessary requirements to thrive in a business environment. Then the last thing that we look at is, again, the technical and the hard infrastructure. As much as, you know, we've seen the, the, a lot of people would say that, you know, the pandemic gave us an accelerated rate of digitization. But that cannot be possible should we not have sufficient broadband infrastructure looking at 4G, 3G, as well as 5G. Um, but then also looking at the technical infrastructure that goes into uh, connectivity, looking at fiber cable uh, connectivity that we have uh, in the region. This is the one that allows you know, the, this particular conversation, for example, to happen. Remote learning, distance learning, you know, distance working, doesn't really matter. But when it comes to building software, building apps, building technology that is scalable, that is disruptive, um, it all rests on the backbone of hard telecom infrastructure 
uh, that majority of us don't see, but we really benefit from it in many ways. And entrepreneurs are the first in line to really, really utilize all of that. Uh, and then again, within that whole hard infrastructure, you know, we've got the soft infrastructure, which is the community. Um, we've seen the likes of Silicon Cape, as I mentioned, uh, the Cape Ice Initiative, the Stellenbosch Network. These communities create a knowledge sharing platform where entrepreneurs, innovators, and various other stakeholders can come together, network, access financing, access expertise, uh, you know, set business practices, and more, more so share best business practices. And it's within these communities that we see a thriving ecosystem where companies and entrepreneurs, innovators, tech companies can share expertise uh, and actually leverage on each other's resources and capabilities to scale to their next. So when we look at the ecosystem, that's, that's just a few of the matrix that we're looking at. But, you know, we can break it down even more into the regulatory environment. We can break it down into access to market. We can break it down to various components and constituents. But ultimately, the availability of strong institutions, hard infrastructure, as well as a community is the one that really drives any ecosystem. When we look at global ecosystems across the world, if you want to look at San Francisco, which is, you know, the generally renowned one, we're seeing the universities, we're seeing the startup grinds, we're seeing, you know, all these avenues in which, you know, uh, entrepreneurs can succeed and are, are primed to succeed. But again, it's evolving and context change as geographies change. So it's a lot of question as to what, you know, drives the ecosystem and how this Western Cape ecosystem looks like. But fundamentally, there are so many moving parts, and it's great to see that entrepreneurs are also part of that trajectory uh, in terms of moving the ecosystem, driving growth of the ecosystem, and also creating those linkages within the ecosystem and using the components that are available for them. Competition must definitely be growing between different areas within the Western Cape. How good is competition like this for the tech industry? Definitely, there is a lot of competition. I mean, seeing, for example, the uh, Southern Innovation Campus also coming into the fore, right? And that, I think, more than anything, a competitive environment allows us to draw even more robust value proposition for investors. So when we're looking at uh, Cape Town, Stellenbosch, Saldana Bay, uh, we're looking at multiple value propositions that we can create and craft for multinational tech companies. When we look at the proliferation, for example, in Stellenbosch of space companies that are building satellites, launching satellites, supporting space availancing, uh, it's phenomenal. But then when we move to Saldana Bay, we're looking at innovation that particularly revolves around um, the mining industry, energy, and the port infrastructure, and various other much more industrially complex technologies are required in that, in that particular area. And then, of course, Cape Town is a metropole we'll see a far more diverse but more business service orientated innovations. And we're seeing the growth of fintech. You know, Luna has taken over one of our skyscrapers. And it's amazing because it just sits alongside, you know, institutional banks, the standard banks and the APSIS and the FNB. And now you look at the Cape Town skyline, which used to be banks. Suddenly there is a fintech cryptocurrency exchange platform on that. So the competition says there is more diversity for investors. And from a Westgrove perspective, we love it because we're trying to create that ecosystem where there is diversity for investors. And I want to quickly drive to a point in that when we look at the tech sector in 10 years ago, we were not looking at specializations. We we're just looking at technology as a whole. But now we're actually talking about subsectors within tech. And again, going to Stellenbosch, we're seeing the likes of agri-tech, particularly around the wine industry, um, and they've deemed it wine tech, you know. Um, so we're seeing how that economy, that side, is driving its own form of entrepreneurship and innovation. And now it's creating its own subsector within a sector already. The competition creates a more robust ecosystem because it saturates and it floods the market and allows us to now cluster the economy or the tech economy more, um, more intentfully uh, and more strategically. Uh, we can talk about now the fintechs, you can talk about the software service companies, the marketplaces, the platforms, the agri-techs, energy tech companies, and so forth. The spectrum is broad because we have flooded the tech sector and the tech market. And it's because of this competition that happens across regions within the Western Cape. Uh, everyone is developing their own value proposition. And it's, it's amazing. For FDI investors, some of them are directly attracted to Stellenbosch for various reasons. A majority of them that we're seeing is just to be closer to the university and its research capacity. So looking at R&D, but also looking at a skill set that comes out from that. Uh, whereas when we look at the innovations that the companies that are attracted to Cape Town, particularly as a metropole, is to have access to the market, is to have access to the big brand in that Cape Town is.
um, and that they can use as value propositions for their clients, employees, and various other stakeholders that they, that they engage with. Thanks, Mo. So what exactly draws international tech investors to the Western Cape? Recently, when we look at the global geography, value propositions of tourism and the ability to set up remote offices in Cape Town work exceptionally well for certain investors, whereas uh, for other investors, uh, value propositions that are more technical, i.e. the skills availability, costs of doing business, as well as you know, energy sustainability and so forth, all of those are far more appealing to those uh, particular investors. But what sits uh, consistently for all these businesses is the fact that we actually have one of the best tech communities and ecosystems on the continent. And what that means is that when we look at our the success rates of our tech companies, we've seen that they have ability to not just scale in the Western Cape, but to scale not just also in South Africa, but in Africa and internationally. We look at the likes, for example, of Get Smarter, which was acquired by 2U, uh, a US-listed company. We look at the likes of West Mass Transport that managed you know, to scale not just in the Western Cape, but now are owning markets in uh, the Latin, in South America, in East Asia, and they're expanding into Africa and Europe. And those are just a few cases of, of really great tech companies that are coming from, from the Western Cape. Uh, NASPAS as well, you know, together the whole group, including Media24, Superbalist, Take A Lot, they really helped drive the growth of the tech ecosystem uh, and are still part and parcel of shaping how that looks like by either empowering innovators, empowering entrepreneurs, uh, and creating platforms for entrepreneurs to grow on their own services and their platforms. So we see that our the fact that we've got really great cases of companies that are not just only homegrown, but they are also now international brands. It's phenomenal. And that's what a lot of investors are, are, are wanting to tap into, is to tap into an intellectual capacity that allows for not just business as usual, but for entrepreneurial skills. And these entrepreneurial skills are taught not just because, you know, we are a growing economy, but because we are a developing economy, actually, we are able to far, to, to far more be entrepreneurial in our pursuits whether it be between our nine to five or just driving from home to work, right? So those entrepreneurial pursuits are the ones that are also somewhat embedded within the culture of South Africans. And again, I think the Western Cape as a whole is planned for that because when we look at the universities, University of Cape Town, Stellenbosch, University of Stellenbosch, its incubator program has been awarded the best incubator in Africa for several years. They've generated the amount, the most amount of uh, intellectual property in the country. UCT, on the other hand, has year on year uh, ranked uh, the first in the world, uh, and then UWC just came up and you know launched a satellite together with SpaceX into into space. So our capacity for entrepreneurship is fairly deep within the way we learn, the way we think, and the way we coexist. And within companies, particularly when you look when you look at the dynamics of foreign direct investments uh, that are particularly resource seeking, and in the tech sector, that particular resource is not gold and minerals and agricultural produce. It's human skill. It's human capacity. It's human skill that can not just be, be skilled for one thing, but can be constantly reskilled and upskilled and reskilled and upskilled. And a core aspect of that is being able to have entrepreneurial individuals. So that's one of the key drivers. But then when we also want to look at local government support, uh, we want to see not just local government support, but ecosystem support as a whole. We want to see uh, the ability for the region to really, really pull parts of the value chain in the ecosystem, either for market access or for proliferation of uh, or flooding of said company into the market as well. So it's, it's, it's a various cohort of factors uh, that attract multinationals into the region. But the core underlying thing, I think, is the fact that we have amazing people in the Western Cape. We've touched on the benefits of competition within the tech ecosystem earlier. Can you elaborate on the vital ingredients for the development of a competitive tech ecosystem? When we look at the ingredients for a tech ecosystem, we really want to look at you know, what has helped a startup, an early stage startup, move from A to B. And of course, we've highlighted the importance of skills and being able to, to reskill and upskill. But again, access to resources in close proximity. I mean, we look at uh, tech companies have not necessarily niche requirements, but when building the next app, when building the next drone company, there are certain resources that you need, um, such as software licensing and or cloud storage space and cloud credits and so forth. 
one of those is having a marketplace actually that can allow entrepreneurs to access these uh, is fairly, fairly important. And we, we look at the likes of, you know, how Amazon AWS has started to set up, you know, one of their biggest operations in Africa here in, in the Western Cape. This allows startups and founders to access that infrastructure of AWS to build their technology on it and ultimately to grow from that. And this puts, you know, our, our startups at a far more advantage because they've got such close proximity to any programming, any support, and any, you know, uh, opportunity that AWS can provide uh, entrepreneurs. And they've done so much work through partnering with the local ecosystem, partnering with accelerators, incubators, universities, ecosystem bodies, and various others, just to make sure that entrepreneurs locally have the best support that they need. Uh, and that's the first place. So that's the first one, right? It's access to resources and tools that can be used to build a startup. Uh, and these, of course, generally would be technical. The second one, again, is access to financing. And of course, we can talk on length about venture capital in South Africa and venture capital in Africa. But access to financing, you know, gives companies that necessary runway for them to uh, to scale and, and, and to grow. And when we look at data from 2013, Cape Town has drawn the highest uh, year on year, the highest amount of not just uh, investment deals, but also investment volumes. So it shows that there are bankable solutions that are being driven in the Western Cape. And investors are very much happy to trust and back Cape Town-based tech businesses. And of course, like I can say, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, our success stories transcend our borders. You know, we're seeing homegrown tech companies raising over 100 million US dollars, such as the likes of Jumo, Yoko, amongst others, just to scale and rapidly advance uh, into new markets. So bank, so the technology that we're growing is phenomenal. It's competitive. It is bankable. And of course, we're seeing private sector leading this efforts to invest in tech companies. And we're very, very excited about that because it is this initiative by private sector to support entrepreneurship that creates a far more growing ecosystem, but more so creates a competitive ecosystem where we're seeing now you know, the value chain of the fintech industry being far more broadened, the value chain of the edtech ecosystem being far more broadened, agriculture, energy, and so forth and so forth. And then the last one I think um, that I'll touch on, and of course there are many of them, but the last one that I want to touch on is on mentorship. It's very, very important that we see role models that look like us, uh, who can grow, who can support new and aspiring founders. We can say these are the challenges that you will experience and these are the best practices in navigating these challenges. These are the resources that you need and these are the avenues that you should follow and pursue in terms of uh, growing your business. And in so doing, it's in a way playing big brother or big sister uh, for entrepreneurs. In the Western Cape, you know, it's communities such as the Silicon Cape and the Stellenbosch Network that allows for such mentorship to be uh, fostered within the community. Uh, we see the likes of Innovation City now that's bringing heavyweights from the international community who have invested in the likes of Spotify and Candy Crush. So we see all these investors from the international perspective who are now also trying to help mentor, support local entrepreneurs to say, if you're going to scale in European markets or scale in other markets, this is what you need to know. Not just you know, the business practice, but the cultural nuances that are very, very important uh, when you want to scale internationally. So it's very important that, you know, we groom and we create a platform for mentorship, uh, but we also support the local communities that are trying to connect the tech ecosystem together. This could be through panels and webinars and so forth, but these are the ones where we can identify the mentors that we need for entrepreneurs and future innovators. So why is it important from a government and from an economic growth point of view to support the development of a competitive tech industry? It's imperative from government uh, to, to support, you know, the development of the tech ecosystem solely because when we look at the global trends, global economies, the general trajectory of any economy is from firstly being primary sector driven, i.e., you know, mineral beneficiation, so mining activities, manufacturing, all those downstream activities, agriculture, and when we look at agriculture, looking at not agro-processing, but the actual farming practice. Those are the early stages of any growing economy that, you know, they are built on these industries. As the economy grows, those industries modify a bit and they become the secondary industries. And these industries then start to require more skills-intensive uh, individuals. We're looking at now, you know, process manufacturing. We're looking at agri-processing and any other form of large-scale industrialization 
activities. But then as the, the, the economy grows furthermore, uh, we're seeing the emergence of the tertiary sector and the tertiary sector driving in, you know, the services sector mostly. We're looking at now complicated, uh, not necessarily complicated, but the more uh, nuanced services that drive the economy. Just looking at banking, insurance, retail, leisure, and tourism. Uh, and if you look at, you know, going all philosophical, the nice little hierarchy of needs, the basic, we all need to eat, right? But the self-actualization spend at the top of the pyramid. And the tertiary sector now is doing exactly that. It's taking that nice little hierarchy of need and shifting it a bit because saying that now our self-actualization requirements as a society, as a community, are much more now important. Now we are all having mobile devices that, you know, we can tap our phones and pay. We're calling Ubers. We're doing all sorts of things very, very much digitally. And that's because it services driven. And as we look at how, how the economy uh, develops and becomes more complex, it's then we're seeing that, you know, um, global economy starts adopting technologies and they start integrating the use of those technologies in their processes and starts using technology as uh, economic driver because of firstly two things. It's full of the impact, i.e. how can it support other sectors? How can it support job creation? How can it support other businesses? And it's multiply impact. What else can come from it? And, you know, we're seeing how many companies will have spin-offs, et cetera. But ultimately, the multiplier impact now creates a downstream avenue for new businesses to emerge. Let's look at, for example, the banking industry, how if we break it down, suddenly we need payment integrators between shop fronts <laughs> on an e-commerce marketplace. So for, with that landscape set, you know, the economy is industrializing very rapidly, globally, the global economy as well. For South Africa and the Western Cape, it's so important that we start realizing this because then we can really start prioritizing and taking advantage of what digitization can have for the economy. This in terms of job creation, accessing new products, accessing new intellectual property, you know, the opportunity, which is highly unspoken of, but of exporting technology services to the global market. So it's, it's, it's very important that we really, really consider what that, you know, how can we as South Africa take advantage of it? And the second thing is because of our young population, and again, you know, we, we can talk about all the gloomy stuff about our unemployment rate, particularly within the youth. This is an opportunity again for us to actually tap into that potential. If we look at the European population, 50% of it is over the age of 60, <laughs> with the average age in South Africa is between 18 and 30. So now we've seen that South Africa's young population is now likely to service a very old economy in European markets, whereas we can tap into our economy, digitize it, upskill and reskill it, and make it more productive for the economy from creating not just jobs, but creating new jobs, creating jobs for the future, and allowing our youth and young people to become also globally competitive as a labor force. Uh, globally competitive in the sense of skills, globally competitive in the sense of entrepreneurship, and the, in a, in the capacity to innovate. So there is a lot of opportunity that we can tap into, that we need to tap into. It's imperative that we do, uh, because the rate of digitization globally is, you know, growing very, very fast. Moore's law is something that we're seeing on a daily basis. The amount of data we consume and generate is just requir it requires us to have more and more processor speed. But processor speed becomes more and more complex as they become more and more smaller, advanced, and so forth. In all of this, you know, we're seeing that the need for digital adoption by state, uh, by government, and supporting digital economy, I feel like we should set a similar target as we did for the SDGs. We're net, uh, net zero carbon neutral by 2030. We should set similar ambitions when it comes to digitization because truthfully speaking, we are, we are going to set ourselves at a disadvantage. We're going to see the same dynamics that you know, govern international trade where developing countries and the global south are either going to be taken advantage of and exploited or alternatively they can lead the fore because they have the capacity, the skills, the labor force and the opportunity to scale into those international markets. The saying, you know, necessity is the mother of innovation. We've got so many challenges and we're seeing how in innovation entrepreneurship is actually stepping to the fore to address those challenges. Before we had Apple Pay, we had M-Pesa. So today, Apple Pay is big because of the backbone infrastructure that M-Pesa said that, you know, payments can be done through a mobile wallet. Large industries are being shook to the core from insurance, education, Clearly, the pandemic showed us that there's no need for four walls to learn. 
of course, learning happens in communities, but now those communities are digitizing as well. Those communities are developing a whole new set of norms and practices. They're setting up a whole new set of values. So now the, the, the conversation really is a lot about how can we grow the economy. The question is, how can we advance, step up to support digitization innovation, leverage our existing resources, and then make sure that we've got that pipeline and the funnel of entrepreneurship and innovation where we can sit, see new business models come out and actually be the leaders in this. In, in digitization. Of course, we can talk about the global dynamic, you know, people talk about leapfrogging, but then again, you know, it's, uh, how do we quickly divest and invest in new technology when we're both struggling to put kids through school? But that's now the conversation that we need to start having with the global community as to how do we finance all of this? How do we create an enabling environment where we can simultaneously divest and simultaneously invest in capacity to scale this entrepreneurship, scale innovation? The lowest hanging fruit at the moment for our state and our government is primarily in education. And then once we can get that right, the 5G connectivity and sooner or later, quicker than we know, it will be at 7G. I don't know if it will be called 7G, but whatever it is then, it will be the driving force of connectivity. And for example, data centers are becoming more and more necessary in markets, you know, no more the need for a data center in European markets and and American markets, we need data centers on the African soil, physically on the African soil, because of the amount of data we're generating, the amount of data we're consuming as well. So there is a whole for that infrastructure can only come and we can only take full advantage of it. If I think we start at the grassroots level in terms of education, on digitization, on innovation, on entrepreneurship, and the various aspects and value chains uh, and life cycles of technology. Thanks, Mo. In closing, what levers does the government have to support the development of a competitive tech industry, both on a local level and on a national level? Policy, of course, exists at various levels. And government, as policymakers, uh, both at administrative and legislative aspects, they have the ability to look at what industry is doing, engage with industry, particularly the local government perspective, and then feedback that into higher powers that enable policy, a policy environment. Bylaws, amongst others, are incentives that can be leveraged and utilized to foster entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, but also there are structural changes that need to be addressed and adhered to. When we're looking at structural reformations and structural changes, we need to be able to really hone into the various ecosystem role plays and stakeholders, uh, not just government, but private sectors, NGOs, and MPOs, so that we can really reform and change those structural barriers. A good example I can give in that is, for example, uh, there was a case that was done in, in the United States. This was a systems thinking exercise where they wanted to up a school's grade and make sure that there's a higher uh, matriculation rate and also higher uptake into university. For them to achieve that, they had to firstly gather the state in terms of what are they doing in the cur to support curricular development. And the state had to reform the various policies that are necessary for curricular reform and make sure that the curricula and the school is fully capacitated from teachers, materials, and resources to really deliver content for the kids. The next exercise that I have to look at is university readiness. And they engage with the university to say, what do you need to see in terms of the amount of students that can get into university. And they said what was required and translated that into a university readiness programs that can be used both in school and outside of the school. And that's the last part of it. So what happens outside the school? Does the students who are in the school have sufficient support in terms of homework, in terms of co-curricular, everything else that they need so that they can firstly up their marks, secondly, make sure that they're competitive enough to enter the university space. And once all of these stakeholders were engaged, and of course the, the outside of school area that I forgot to mention was that there were co-curricular activities. This were anything from sporting codes, community service, all the way through to you know extra skills development for certain courses or languages or whatever. But these were smaller steps that students could take outside of the, you know, the, the class environment. Instead of learning the Pythagoras theorem, they're also learning community skills. And these were very important for them you know, in their CVs when they're applying to university, but also to refine their learning from their in-classroom learning. What this does is show the ability of a system to coexist to serve one cause, which was to increase the metric pass rate and increase the uptake of students going into varsity. One metric. 
So when we're looking at, you know, local government and its capacity, you know, government is a legislator and an administrator and they've got capacity to either local government to either advocate with us or to reduce red tape. Uh, and of course, at the community level, that's what we experience, particularly businesses. The majority of them is red tape. So when it comes to identifying, you know, the labels that they can use, it's the firstly the advocacy component. But for that, we fully realize government needs to, to have a large data set. It has to be close to the pain points and to the struggles of businesses. And that's why Westray also exists, right? So to ensure that we are the ear to government for these pain points, these pressure points that private sector experiences. These pressure points can be anything from, you know, again, permits and licenses all the way through to far more complex uh, requirements such as customs requirements and, you know, migration issues amongst others. So it's very, very important that we, as business leaders, uh, we understand the role of local government in, uh, in supporting advocacy requirements, but also reducing red tape where they can and have capacity to re reduce red tape. When it comes to national structural barriers, then we have to partner with government, with local government in advocacy. And because that's where we can see those structural reforms uh, come into fruition. We can see how the, in education, for example, the right skill sets can be taught to students. Entrepreneurship, innovation, you know, what can they do to learn those skills as well? The world is digitizing. Can, they, can students now learn the basics of understanding technology? They don't have to code or anything, but understand technology life cycles and how they grow and how they form and shape society. So in most of this, this is where the role that we see stakeholders and government working together, predominantly in addressing the structural issues uh, as a collective uh, and as partners and listening to each other. I think that's the key thing. Uh, as Westgrove, we have to listen to both. We're always listening to both. But again, it's not translating all of that into something that's meaningful and impactful. A big thank you to Sebekedi Motlobani Kuloi, Greenfield Investment Portfolio Manager for Technology at Westgrove for such an insightful conversation around building a globally competitive tech hub.